Hello, hello, hello. I'm glad you're all able to join us today. Today we're taking our third look at Jesus' practice of eating. I remember last year about this time mentioning how almost 100,000 people in the United States had died from the coronavirus. And now we're closing in almost 800,000. And by January, February, they say it's gonna be up over a million. That's almost unimaginable. Yet what do people complain about the most? The loss of freedom to socialize with their friends and others. This is a primal drive that we have as human beings and it has a huge impact on us and one that this virus exploits. This isn't to downplay or sideline the tragedy of so many deaths. How people are reacting to the loss of freedom to socialize, to go out to eat or visit friends or family or travel illustrates just how important these stories about Jesus' social interactions with others really is. Something that we often miss or overlook because we focus on teaching, the words of Jesus, and not so much on the social interaction or context in which they take place. In the ancient world and many other places around the world today, Jesus' social interactions speak as loud as his words. And the story of Jesus eating with Simon the Pharisee and the woman who wiped his feet with her hair is a powerful example of this in Luke chapter 7. Immediately prior to Simon inviting Jesus to a meal at his house in Luke's gospel, Luke records for us the accusations about John being demon-possessed and Jesus being a glutton and a drunkard. Luke 7.31 to what then shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? They are like the children sitting in the marketplace calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine and you say, he has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. We already looked at this passage in the first video on meals. Did Jesus have a weight problem? And I'll have a link to it up over here and in the show more section underneath this video. To cut to the chase, Jesus' practice of eating with sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors was scandalous in Israel and also in the setting of the early church. And his practices would be scandalous today as well. However, he also ate with the movers and the shakers within society. The story of Jesus eating at Simon's house brings all of this together and it creates a powerful visual image that should challenge the way we look at fellowship with one another. If you're new here, you're watching the Caffeinated Bible and my name is David Paris. I've been teaching at seminaries around the world for over the past 20 years and the goal of this channel is to bring what I've been teaching to anyone on YouTube. These videos represent a lot of research and work, so if you find them encouraging, please do me a favor and subscribe, hit the share button under the video, and let others know about these videos also. And finally, I have an experiment in this video. Let's see how many of you can hit the thumbs up button down below and see if we can get close to 100% thumbs up for this video. Thanks. We'll see if that works or not. Back to Luke chapter 7. In 736, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. This is more than just a family meal at Simon's house. It would have been a formal meal around the triclinium. In 749, it mentions that there's other guests present as well. These would have been men and would have represented perhaps the influential leaders within that town. But right there in 737, one verse into our story, it says, behold, and it's this Greek interjection, I do, and it's kind of this idea of shazam or wow. It really conveys that something amazing has happened. And behold, a woman enters the meal. She is also referred to as a sinner. 
This is an underdetermined term that requires the reader to fill in what it means. Most likely it was a reference to sexual immorality during that day. The rabbis referred to three categories of sinners, murderers, tax collectors, and prostitutes. And remember, this is the context in which Jesus is living. Her brain perfume and her actions would have also led the original readers to picture her in this light, as no honorable woman would do publicly what she is doing. Some think that for a woman to barge into a meal in this way was a way that the poor had to beg for food or money. There's really little evidence to support this idea, and it's a way to kind of get over this. Behold, how did she get into this room? In reality, these meals were seen as times when the purity standards within Israel were exercised. For someone who was unclean and morally impure to enter a meal like this would have made the meal unclean, according to the views during that day. Now, we're not told exactly how she gets into this meal, but one thing is certain. She has broken through the cultural rules of those days, first by entering Simon's house, second by entering into the meal both as a sinner and as a woman, because this meal would have been for men, and third by the very actions she's performing at this meal. In verse 38, we're told that she stands behind Jesus weeping, wetting his feet with her tears, wiping his feet with her hair, kissing them, and anointing his feet. These are all very emotional actions and highly intimate in nature. Imagine if you were in that room with 8 to 15 other people. Her presence, emotions, actions, and the anointment perfume would have filled that room. And while everyone else is looking on, Jesus seems to be oblivious or even encouraging her actions. It would be hard to find a present-day analogy as to what is taking place. It's that scandalous. Perhaps the closest would be is to be at some sort of church meal, and a woman walks in and gives one of the clergy a lap dance while everyone else is watching. It would be shocking and outrageous at the very least. In the midst of this, Jesus knows the thoughts of Simon. And we need to ask, why is he mentioned in particular? And I think one of the reasons is, is that a lot of these people, Nicodemus, Zacchaeus, Simon, that are mentioned specifically in the Bible, may have gone on to become leaders within the church later on. Because Luke tells us in the book of Acts that many of the Pharisees came to follow Jesus. Now, Simon's thoughts run along these lines. A. If Jesus were a prophet, then he would know who she is. If he knows this, then why would he let her touch him? Therefore, Jesus cannot be a prophet. In the middle of all this, Jesus then gives a prophetic word. Simon, I have something to say to you. Now, what a presumptuous line. We miss this. Simon is the host of the meal. Jesus is the guest who is getting the foot massage. Yet Jesus is going to tell his patron or host something. And Jesus then proceeds to tell Simon a parable about two debtors. Starting in verse 740, it reads, And Jesus said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Now notice how Simon hedges his bets here. When he answers Jesus, he says, the one, I suppose, who owes more money. We often miss why he might be hedging his bets here. A, he might think that something is about to come. This is a rather interesting story. Why is the teacher saying this? And B, in this context in which the meal is taking place, Simon would have been the person who loaned monies to other. Simon most likely saw himself as the central character of the parable, the patron. But Jesus turns the tables. He is the patron who pardons the debts of his clients, not Simon. This ties in directly with the context of the meal. In that culture, lines of patronage were extended and established at meals. And this parable is about patronage. The patron has loaned money to two individuals, and now he has to decide what to do when they can't repay. So he demonstrates his benevolence and forgives both. 
This would have earned the patron honor and standing within that culture. And the debtors in this story would now be indebted to him to give praise to his name to others and to defend his honor in public. In 714, what we have now is code switching, where Jesus changes the cultural and linguistic values of that day in a way that is rather unexpected. Starting with 744. Then, turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began saying among themselves, Who is this that even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now just to note, I've been reading from the English Standard Version in this video. When Jesus asked Simon, Do you see this woman? That is such a silly question. No one could miss her or what she was doing in this room. Notice also how Luke describes Jesus' actions. Jesus turns to the woman. Now, going back to the layout of a triclinium, and I've got a picture here for you to look at. The benches were often laid out in a U-shape. The diners would recline on cushions with their heads facing the center where the food would have been served. Up until now, Luke implies that Jesus had been facing the center of the triclinium, perhaps even facing Simon directly. He now turns from Simon to the woman. Both physically and verbally, Jesus reverses the social code and practices of this meal. Simon's lack of social protocols are then compared to the woman's inappropriate actions. The lack of honor that he has not shown Jesus is compared with hers. And the punchline comes in 747. She loves much because she has been forgiven much. This then allows us to align the parable with the context there. She is the greater debtor. Her daring and highly provocative actions sprang from her experience of being forgiven a great debt. This makes Simon the lesser of the debtors, no longer the wealthy patron or lender that he might have thought he was. At the same time, the parable moves Jesus above Simon. Jesus in this parable is the lender, the patron. Both this woman and Simon are people indebted to him. But the real punchline comes with the idea that this woman is now above Simon. She loves more and she bestows more honor upon Jesus, something which Simon has failed to do. In 748 and 49, Jesus then pronounces her forgiven. The other guests pick up on this and ask the key question so we don't miss it. Who is this then that even forgives sins? This story creates a beautiful image on both the verbal and the imaginative level. On the verbal level, you have the parable and then Jesus' pronouncement of forgiveness and then the other people there asking, who is this that even forgives sins? Lest we miss the point that this is all about the Messiah. On the imaginative level, if you put yourself within that room with the triclinium, it creates a beautiful picture about Jesus' teachings and radical inclusion and fellowship and what this means. Here at this meal, we have a very high-ranking man, Simon the Pharisee. Jesus is dining with him, and into this meal, a notorious sinner intrudes and totally captures the meal by her life and actions. If we were to compose an oil painting of this scene like the great masters did, we would have Jesus reclining at this triclinium, facing Simon in the center of the table. At his feet, we would have the woman kneeling, kissing, and wiping his feet with her hair. Jesus then forms the bridge between these two, the respected and the dishonorable, the religious leader and the sinful, the male and the female, the power broker and the broken. The reason why the church should practice radical inclusion, it's not to feel good or some other sentimental reason. Rather, it's because of who Jesus was, how he lived, and how he practiced table fellowship and what he taught. 
Jesus' practice of eating meals was a visible and physical way to teach his disciples about the inclusive nature of God's kingdom. At Simon's table, Jesus demonstrated and taught about inclusion and fellowship. But by using food and drink, Jesus was able to help us grasp what the kingdom of God means in this very mundane manner of eating. As you go through these holiday seasons, I'd like you to reflect upon how you eat and who you eat with and how you can use this as a way to extend God's kingdom or instantiate it within your very life. Until next week when we pick up on the final video on Meal and Mission where we look at the Lord's Supper, I'll leave you with a word of peace. Thank you.